Hello, it is good to see everyone again after another week, and I am blessed to spend this time with you, the church, and to present the Word of God. And so today we will have a wonderful time together as we will look at our lives, our lives as a Christian, our lives as newborns, a life that is with God. And so we are going to look at the Christian life today. So this morning, I want us to see the importance of this life, the importance of our saved life, this Christian life that you and I hold on to, and namely, what happens after? What takes place after you and I receive salvation? What happens It is a wonderful gift that you and I have received, and so I want us to be able to cherish this gift fully. I trust that we all know how important our salvation is. I believe we know how important our salvation is, but do you and I, do we know the responsibilities that come with this life? There are responsibilities. There are still duties that we must do. There are still commands that we must hold on to. And frankly, many times, even with my own eyes, I have seen, even with family and with friends, people who have chosen this path, people who have chosen Jesus, people who have received salvation, yet they still live their lives as if they never knew Jesus Christ as if they don't know what the Bible commands of them. Again, this is a wonderful gift by the grace of God that you and I have received. Yet, so many people, they live so differently from what the Bible says, and they continue to do whatever they want without no repercussions, thinking that they can do whatever they want still. But our life as a Christian commands us to live differently. And there are different reasons as to why people still live such a life. People who choose Jesus but still live as if they don't have Jesus. They either have neglected salvation, this gift that has been given to them, or they just don't know what salvation truly means. And so they live and they live life as if they want But let me propose for us today that salvation, this gift that you and I have been given, okay? Let me propose for us today that with salvation comes responsibility with how we are to live as a Christian. And so there are responsibilities, there are duties that we must hold on to, that we must commit our lives to as a Christian. And Scripture, the Bible will help show us how to respond in a correct manner. With such a gift that we have been given, we must respond in a correct and biblical manner. So, if you proclaim salvation, if you say you know Jesus, if you have Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, then you will listen to these commands. Not because I say it, but because the Bible says it. Not because of me, but because God says it. If you proclaim salvation, remember these commands. Remember these commands. We cannot just sit back, relax, kick our feet up, and just wait for life to happen. Wait for God to do something for us. That is not what the saved life is. That is not who a Christian is. And so with this gift that you and I have been given, we must respond. We must respond. And so that is what we will see exactly here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 16. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. And before I start reading it, I do want to share that there is the word therefore in this passage that we will read. 
And with this word, therefore, it's going to bring us back. It's going to make us reflect back to what was written prior to these three verses. And so if we see, if we go back and read verses 1 to 12, we will see that the apostle Peter is talking about salvation. He's talking about the wonderful gift that you and I have been given, this gracious gift that we have been given. And so he reflects and he says, okay, in direct response to the passage that we will read, he talks about salvation, talks about how wonderful it is. It talks about how we have been given new life. And so, as he writes to the Christians who have been exiled in the Roman Empire, who are under harsh, harsh persecution, he reminds them of their salvation. Hold on to the salvation that you have been given. And so he arrives and he writes in verses 13 and 16 and says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let us pray and ask for guidance from the Lord. God, we thank you for your word for us today. From 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. We have been blessed tremendously through the life of your Son, Jesus Christ. And when we believe, when we trust, when we have faith in Him and what He has done for us, we are delivered. We are saved from our own peril, from sin and death. And for that, we ought to give you thanks. We praise you for your goodness and for your faithfulness, for your mercy that you have blessed us with this morning. And so help us, Lord, to be able to understand your word today, to be able to respond in a correct biblical manner that would only bring you more honor and glory forever and ever. May you, Lord, cast out any distractions within us this hour, from our phones to our friends, to anything, Lord, that may cause us to stumble, but help us to be able to receive your word fully and completely this morning. May your spirit go before us during this time. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in verses 13 to 16, the apostle Peter writes and he reflects back on the previous verses and affirms the wonderful gift that you and I have received as Christians. This new life, being born again. And he shares with us a few things here that I want to impress onto our hearts to help us to be able to respond to this salvation. And so Peter reflects and shares that salvation in verse 3 is living hope. Salvation is living hope. And he continues in verse 4. It is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then he gets to verse 10 and 12, where Peter shares that salvation is the theme of Scripture. From day one to day now, to this present life, Salvation is the constant theme throughout Scripture, from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. From day one when we were a sinner to this very moment that we know Christ. Scripture proclaims and says that salvation is the theme of Scripture. And so in verses 10 and 12, Peter talks about the prophets the prophets of the Old Testament who testified 
to this salvation by their diligence of seeking out who this person was, about finding out what this item, what this object was. And not only the prophets, but the apostles as well. This was the very message that the apostles preached. Salvation. Salvation is here. To the point of the angels who are in the heavens awaiting for the completion of salvation for their very own lives as well. And so, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, salvation is the theme of Scripture. The prophets, they sought what salvation meant. The apostles, they preached what salvation is. And the angels, they wait for this very moment like you and I. And as Peter writes to these Christians, he reminds them and he reminds us as we will study this morning how we are to respond to salvation. So there are two essentials that I want to share with us. Two things that we can do that we learn from verses 13 and 16. There are two essentials that we need to know. And these two essentials, they are commandments. Commandments that would glorify, would honor God himself. The first thing, essential number one, is that as saved people, as people who believe, people who trust, people who know, people who are saved, Scripture here says, we hope. We hope. We have hope. We have hope. Because you and I have been saved and been given such a wonderful gift by the grace of God. Peter says that we are to respond with hope. Now, I know hope is not a tangible, physical thing. We can't just grasp onto hope. And use hope, like how we use money, like how we drive a car. It's not tangible. It's not a physical thing. But hope is belief. Hope is trusting. Hope is faith. It's not tangible. It's not physical. It's not something that we can just physically grab onto. But it's something that lives inside you and I. This hope that we are to respond with, it is a command. And Scripture says here in verse 13, set your hope, fix your hope. Live in light of hope. Live in light of this hope that you have been given. And he says just don't live in hope, but he says to live in hope fully, completely, without reservations, Without indecisiveness, he says, live in hope fully and completely. Fix your eyes to the future. And that is what hope is. Hope is not right now. Hope is not this present life. Hope is looking to the future. And so as a Christian, we hope. We're not hoping for the now, for the moments that are going to come today, but we are looking forward to the future and what God has for us in the future. It's not this life right now. With hope, this powerful tool that you and I have been given, with hope that you and I are to respond with, with hope, the Christian life, this mindset, this attitude, it is for the future. It is for the future. And it makes so much sense for these Christians who are in exile, who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Peter writes to them and says, have hope. Look forward to the future. Look forward to what is in store for you. Despite the harshness of life, despite the constant persecution, have hope. Have hope. Look forward to the future. We can ask, and we should ask, what's in the future for a Christian? 
a person who believes in God, what is in the future? Many of us, we say, yes, heaven, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. But what happens in heaven? What happens to our body during that time? What happens to us? What lies in the future for a Christian? What are we supposed to hope in? What are we supposed to look forward to? It says here, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the what? The grace. Set your hope. Look forward to the grace that is going to come. The grace that is going to come. Grace lives now in our lives, and grace lives in the future as well. This undeserved gift is this, that at the end of our lives, when Jesus returns, as we see, at the revelation, at the revealing of Jesus Christ, his second return to this world, at that revelation, we will be made complete. Our lives will finally become glorious. Glorious. This is the hope that you and I are to look forward to. It's not what we have in this world right now. It's not what we have in tomorrow, but it's in the future. This grace that is filled with glory. And in this glory, this great reward, he preserves it for us. He saves it for us until he comes back. And so Peter affirms, and he says this, this hope, this salvation, it's an inheritance. It's undefiled. It's imperishable. It will not go away. It will not fade away. But it's kept in heaven for you until that one day when Jesus returns and receives us into his home. Let me put it this way. You and I, church, Christians, we are saved from our sins. You and I, at this very moment, if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. You are saved. But that's not the end of our salvation story, the end of our life. We are saved right now because we have placed our trust in him. But guess what? Currently, as Jesus is in the heavens, he is mediating. He is speaking on behalf of us with God, and he is saving us at this very moment. So he has saved us from our sin. He is saving us from our sins right now. And guess what? This third thing, this hope that we look forward to, when we are with Jesus, with God, in the heavens, once and for all, we will be completely saved. We will have received glory, sin, suffering, persecution, cancer, death. None of that is present in this life of glory. We have been saved from our sins. We are still being saved right now. Jesus is talking, is speaking with God at this very moment. And one day when Jesus returns and receives us and takes us home to be with the Father, we will be completely made a new person in the image of God himself. We will be glorified. And so that is what we are to fix, to set our hope on. Peter says, Put your hope in that completely, fully. That is what is in store for you and I. And so we are commanded to live in the hope of future, no matter what happens to our life, no matter if it's persecution, if it's death, if it's cancer, if it's any illness, if it's any type of mourning, grieving, suffering, none of that will compare to what is going to happen in the future when you and I are made new again. So how do we set our hope? 
How do we look forward to? How do we fix completely our lives to the future? The first is this. Practice this, okay? Prepare your minds for action, he says at the beginning of verse 13 here. Prepare your minds for action. And at the bottom of your footnotes in the Bible, or if your translation says so, it says to gird up the loins of your mind. What? Gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? Okay. Many of you women who wear dresses, you can probably connect with this better. But Peter says, prepare for action. Get ready for battle. In other words, today, roll up your sleeves and get ready for battle. And so your scripture might say, prepare for action. Prepare your minds for action or gird up the loins of your mind and get ready for battle. But the concept, the thinking is the same. And when Peter says, okay, get ready for action, or when, Bible, or when the Bible says, gird up your loins in your mind, okay, this is a powerful image. Because back then, during this time in the Bible, the men and the women of this ancient time, they didn't have suits, they didn't have a t-shirt, they didn't wear shorts, but they wore tunics. A tunic is a one-piece robe, free-flowing. And so imagine if you were living during this time, you needed to get to a place in a hurry. Or imagine if you're wearing a tunic and running, and you're running into battle, and you're just tripping and stumbling all over yourself because of that robe, because of that tunic. And so to prevent themselves from being hindered by their own clothing, by their own apparel, guess what they did? They took a rope or they took a belt. And just like many of you women who wear dresses, they cinched down, they girded their dress or their tunic. And so that it was only free flowing from the bottom so that they could run freely and move freely without any hindrance so that they could run so that they could get to point A or to point B in a hurry. And so Paul uses this analogy, this metaphor, about the men and women during this time who wore tunics, and he applies it to the what? The mind. And so thus he says, prepare your minds for action. Gird up, tie down the loins in your mind. So he applies that thinking to our mind, and he says, tie down these loose ends in your mind. Tie down these things that are going to distract you in this current life. Get rid of those things so that you can completely and freely focus on the future. So, Christians, brothers and sisters, Tie down the loose ends in your mind so that you can focus on what God has set for you one day. Tie down these distractions. Get rid of these distractions. Get your priorities straight. Focus on what matters. Get your mind screwed down. Get your mind screwed down. Come clean. Don't be distracted. Don't be hindered by this world. Get ready for battle. Roll up those sleeves. Tie down that tunic, that robe. Do not, any, do not let anything hinder your mind so that you can focus, you can set your mind on hope. Get rid of those things so that you can devote yourself to Christ who is going to come and save you. Brothers and sisters, the church, do you and I, do we have that mindset? Can we tie down, can we screw down these things in our head 
that easily distracts us so that we can focus on hope, so that we can let go of all of these hindrances in our life so that we can focus on what is important, so that we can prioritize on what is important. Do not be distracted, consumed, or hindered by these things that can tie us down, that make us stumble, that make us fall, and forget about what lies ahead of us. Concentrate on hope. Concentrate on hope. The second thing about this hope, how we can practice hope, is this. To be sober. To be sober-minded. Being sober is similar to what we just saw about tying these things down in our mind, girding up the loins in our minds. But the thought is this. Being sober-minded is to be free of the intoxications of this world. These things that can come and cause us to lose our mind and to forget about Jesus Christ. And just like being sober from drugs or alcohol, that causes us to be impaired, that causes us to be not ourselves. We need to be clear-minded, focused, self-controlled, and disciplined. Clear-minded, focused, self-controlled, and disciplined. And these are all spiritual values that I am sharing here. We need to have a clear conscience about what the Bible teaches us. About what the Bible teaches us so that we can be convicted, so that we can know what is right and what is wrong. We need to be focused on Scripture and what Scripture says, to be able to memorize and to live out Scripture in our life. We need to be composed spiritually. We need to be disciplined in the heart and in the mind. All of these things spiritually, so that you and I will not be intoxicated, so that we will not be drunk as Ephesians says, do not be drunk on wine, but to be what? To be filled with the Holy Spirit. So in consideration of the hope that we long for, that we anticipate, should we not be living this way? Should you and I not be living this way? We need to tie down the things that hinder us in our mind. Tie these things down and do not be drunk on the passions or desires of this world. Do not be intoxicated by these things so that you and I, we can focus and have our priority on hope. Essential number two, as saved people, as people who confess, people who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. As saved people, be holy. Be holy. So number one, have hope. Number two, be holy. Verse 14 and 16, Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your formal ignorance, but as he who called you who is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And our second response, our second response to our great salvation is a command to live in holiness. To live in holiness. And the truth is this, when you and I, when we hope, when we long for the future, you and I, we live in holiness. When we live every moment with our lives captivated by Jesus and fixed on hope, this glory that is going to come, when we anticipate the return of Jesus, we live holy. We live in holiness and all that it entails. We live in holiness and all that is going to come. If that becomes our focus and our longing and we anticipate what we hope for, we will live 
and holiness. And at this junction, Peter also says, and he addresses that if we are obedient children, okay, not disobedient children. Disobedient children are people who do not know God, who do not live in holiness. But if you are an obedient children, you are living in holiness. As an obedient child, you are to be holy. And it is important for us to know that a Christian is characterized by that. People will know that you are a child of God if you obey. People will know at the same time if you don't obey, you are not a child of God. You do not know God. You do not have salvation. And a child who is obedient to God, this nature, this essence of a Christian life, that is the very nature and the very nature or the very essence of a Christian God as well. So, the second, the second command is to be an obedient child, to be holy yourself, to be pure, to be clean, to be righteous, to be sinless, to be separate from defilement, from wickedness, from sin. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh. Strive for perfection, like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Strive for perfection. Strive for holiness. So how can you and I become holy. Again, two principles here, two things that we can practice. Number one, do not be like the person that you used to be. Do not be like the person that you used to be. And so Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Who you were in the past, that sinful, evil, wicked, defiled person, Do not return to that pattern. Do not become that person again. And this is the very same thought that Paul shares with us in Romans chapter 12. He says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Do not go back. You have been saved. Do not go back and live in sin. Do not go back to wickedness. Do not go back to your old ways. Simple as that. Do not go back to your former self, a disobedient child. Do not be infatuated. Do not be drunk on the passions of this world. Do not be fashioned after the world any longer. Disconnect yourself from these things. Even if they are your friends, your family, you have something so much more important to look forward to. Your hope. That grace, holiness, be obedient to God and live accordingly to his nature. The second thing that we can practice, the second principle, is the gold standard. This is the rule. This is who we are to be as a Christian. Listen carefully. Peter says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Who here in this verse is the holy one? Who is it? It's God himself. God is the holy one. Who calls us to be holy? God calls us to be holy. Peter is saying, be holy like who else? like God. Be holy like God because he is holy. It's an easy concept to understand, but a hard practice to live. But Peter says, who's the holy one here? God is the holy one. So you are to be like God. Imitate God. Be an imitator of God. Like what Peter says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Imitate. Be an imitator of God. Quit. Run away. And as Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee 
these youthful passions and desires and pursue righteousness, pursue faith, love, and peace, things that are of God. So as you and I, as we cling on to hope, as we look forward to hope, we are to respond with a holy life as well. So live in hope and be holy. Live in hope and be holy. Live a life, a Christian life that is no longer enamored, that no longer wants to be a part of this world, that is full of sin, that is wicked, in which its nature is nothing but chaos and wickedness. Hate sin. Hate sin. Abhor evil. As Scripture says. And hold on to what is good. Continue to strive for the perfection that is holiness, that God called you and I to. This is another act of grace, because guess what? We can't do this with our own minds, with our own bodies. But guess who gives it? Guess who helps us? God. He is the one who calls you and I to it. This effectual calling. We didn't do anything. We can't do anything to achieve this. But God calls you and I to be holy because he is holy. Be holy because I am holy. As I wrap up here, there is a great deal to all of this that we have just learned. Number one, we are to fix, to set our eyes, our lives to the future. None of what happens in this world right now or in the very next minute will, ma- will not matter because what we long for, what we yearn for is in the future. That time when Jesus reveals himself to us. Again, when we have this hope, know that it is assurance, it is security for you and I that is awaiting us. So be faithful. Be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Continue to follow him. Understand and know his word through scripture so that we can be one day made like or made in the image of Jesus Christ. This is our longing. This is what you and I hope for. This is what happens in heaven. We keep talking about heaven, but what happens in heaven? We become like Jesus Christ. That's what happens in heaven. Number two, we are to be like God. We are to be holy. And so despise, hate, abhor evilness, and don't return to it. Despise this formal self and become more like him. The more we become like him, the more we will be closer to him in our relationship. The more we will become holy like him because he is holy. One of the most popular superheroes in the universe is Spider-Man. The kids love him. Many of us love him. I mean, we couldn't even wait for Spider-Man to come into the Marvel Universe. He is one of the most famous, most popular superheroes in the universe. In Spider-Man's life, there is an overarching theme to why he does what he does, to why he web slings, to why he fights crime, to why he avenges with the Avengers. And this theme was shared to him by his uncle, Uncle Ben. In the comics and even in the movies, this theme is resounding. 
And Uncle Ben, he shares this word to Spider-Man. He says, with great power comes great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. This was Spider-Man's theme. This was his mantra. This is why he fights criminals. This is why he is an Avenger. He is a superhero because of this very saying. With great power comes great responsibility. And the same is with us, Christians, brothers and sisters, church. With great power comes great responsibility. This power that you and I have is salvation. And so what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to have hope, have hope, and to be holy. Have hope and to be holy. That should be our theme until Jesus returns. But until then, we have hope and we live a holy life. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God and our Savior, we didn't do anything to deserve this, this grace that you have given to us. We are sinful people. Yet, because of who you are and what you have done, you delivered us. You saved us from our own peril, from our sin, from death. And for that, we are forever grateful. Help us, Lord, in light of our salvation to be able to be responsible with this, with this gift that you have given to us, to be able to live a life that is faithful and is righteous to you until your son, Jesus, returns and takes us back to you. We still live in a world that is full of sin, hatred, wickedness, evil, and even death. But until then, until you return, help us to fix, to set our hope completely on you and what you have in store for us. This great reward, help us to fix our eyes on it, knowing that one day we will be like your son. And help us, despite our sins, despite this wicked and evil world, to be able to live holy, to be like you, a person who will abhor evil, who will hate sin, because you are holy. May you give us strength, give us wisdom to be able to live this life, to live for you, and to be thankful for what you have given to us and our salvation. Father, as we leave today, may you bless us, and may you keep us in your hands, protecting us, Lord, wherever we may go. And may we Again, live in light of our salvation and respond biblically and faithfully to you. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed.